Hello and welcome to Mindful Biology. This is the fifth of five talks about entirety, an exploration in how we relate to our bodies, one, one another, and the natural world. We've been using the ancient four element system in this series, earth, water, air, and fire. This, our final talk, will be about our relationship to the so-called fire element. As before, we'll tie this element to a physical concept. As I think about it, it seems most reasonable to tie the fire element to the physical concept of energy. After all, energy is familiar to us. We pay for it in our electric bills, and we use it on a day-to-day -day basis. We also know that there is this famous formula worked out by Einstein, E equals mc squared, that tells us that energy equals the mass times the speed of light squared of an object. So the amount of energy in an object is equal to this quantity. Another way of saying this is to say that matter is concentrated, very concentrated energy. So let's look at this highly concentrated form of energy we call matter that has this feature we call mass. So matter consists in our day-to-day -day experience of substances built up of enormous numbers of atoms. For instance, if we talk about a substance called air that we discussed in the talk on the air element last time, in the gaseous mixture that makes up our atmosphere, there is the important chemical compound called oxygen, which consists of two oxygen atoms bound together chemically. We can look at one of these oxygen atoms to get a sense as to the deep and powerful features of matter, the characteristics. Everyone has seen diagrams like this that show a nucleus of an atom surrounded by orbits of electrons. This simple diagram has some usefulness, but it's not very accurate, and I'd like to correct a couple of the major inaccuracies. The first is that the electrons don't move in defined orbital pathways. Instead, they fill out a kind of cloud around the nucleus. They move in a wave-like very rapid and dynamic fashion without fixed locations according to the rules of quantum mechanics. So the electrons form a kind of cloud around the nucleus. And this cloud is very, very large compared to the size of the nucleus. If we were to scale things up so that the electron cloud were the size of a football stadium, the nucleus would be the size of a blueberry somewhere in its center. In other words, almost all of the mass or matter of the atom is packed into an incredibly small volume in the very center of the electron cloud. So the nucleus has 99.9% .9 of the mass of the atom, and yet it's in this very tiny little space surrounded by this much larger cloud of electrons. This is where the saying comes from that matter is mostly empty space. If we zoom in further and look at the nucleus, we see even more interesting phenomena. So this is meant to represent an oxygen nucleus. Each of the large spheres is a proton or a neutron. And then the smaller spheres inside are quarks. Quarks are peculiar entities of matter that don't exist in isolation, but only as aggregates. And they don't have defined positions and instead could better be thought of as very intense swirls of energy packed into the unbelievably small space of a neutron or a proton. So this is the energy of matter. And it underlies all the different states of matter that we've already discussed in earlier talks. Solid, liquid, gaseous. We can also talk about energy from the directly experienced sense of things, how we experience energy in our felt, lived, day-to-day -day movements.
the fire element is foundational to the earth, water, and air experiences and can be felt underpinning them. So we feel these elemental qualities in our body. The air element with its movement, so the breath coming in and out many times a minute, and the thoughts flitting this way and that. The water element with its more surging, powerful aspect, the surge of the blood being pumped by the forceful heart, the surge of liquid moving through the digestive tract, the surge of emotional experience in the heart region and other parts of the torso. And then there's the earth element where its energetic quality is most noticed when we move the skeleton walking with the bony, massive skeletal frame being swung this way and that in the legs, for instance, by these massive muscles around the thigh bone, etc. So the elemental qualities that we've been discussing have an energetic basis. And we in meditation can feel into this and become more familiar with what it's really like to live in a human body on a moment by moment basis. And we'll get in contact with the spacious aspect of the interior. So I would encourage you on your uh, meditation times to feel the open spacious quality of the body. You know, if we feel what's between the front and the back and between the two sides of the body, there's a kind of open space in there. But that space is, you know, not a vacuum. It's got a quality of fullness. You know, there's, there's life in there and we can feel that life. And that life is very potent. It's what moves us through our days, even when they're very difficult. It's what allows us to manifest and create. It's what led humanity to do all of the surprising things it has done. It's what led life to spread across the planet and evolve so many forms. So we can feel this in our bodies and I encourage you to make that a part of your meditation practice if you have one. I'm not a physicist, so what I've said about physics is probably uh, barely <laughs> accurate. I'm a, on much firmer ground when I talk about biology, uh, given my background, and I'd like to discuss energy from a biological aspect at this point. Energy is certainly very important to biological systems. In preparing this talk, I came across a very interesting definition for energy as it relates to biology, and that's the ability to create change. So energy is what allows organisms to change their configuration, to change their position, to change their chemistry. The currency of energy exchange in organisms is called ATP. And there's a lot that could be said about that. I want to just address it in the simplest terms in order for us to get a little bit of a handle on the universality of energy in biology. So ATP is a small molecule that needs to be continually produced to fuel life. And every cell of every kind on this planet Earth has a little generator inside it, a kind of molecular organ system that converts other forms of energy into ATP. And we're going to look at this animation of that little organ system now. And you can see how it rotates at its base. So like a little generator, it is allowing a buildup of chemical gradient to drive the turning of its little shaft and with each turn, it puts out ATP molecules, shown as the little red molecule flying out of the generating molecular organ system as it turns. And we can see it here in context with others of its kind. And then now again in isolation. So you can see the base turning and the little red ATP molecules being pumped out of it. So those ATP drive the process of living forward. And this is a shared organ system present in every life form, whether bacterial or plant or animal. So that's the physical aspect of energy in biology. 
uh, very briefly. We can also talk about the experienced aspect of energy in biology, which what we're referring to as the fire element, and think about the ability to create change from this perspective. So the fire element is perhaps what we could look at as the motive force that gets us out of bed in the morning and sends us on our way to do whatever kind of productive activity we do. When people say they have a fire in their belly, they're describing this experience of feeling kind of driven to accomplish something, to manifest in the world. As mentioned, the experienced aspects of the air, water, and earth elements also have a fiery basis, an energetic basis. Something very important that the fire element also propels is growth. And here I mean growth both of the organism in terms of its development, etc., but also of the knowledge base and comprehension what we call a mind. So our minds mature as they adapt to a changing environment and become ever more skillful over time. This is what we refer to as wisdom. And it's the fire element that motivates and pretty much demands this growth of us if we want to you know, get beyond our difficulties. So there's this fiery aspect within us that keeps us moving forward that helps us manifest in the world and that fuels our growth. It reminds me a lot of the Quaker notion of the divine light within. I began my psycho-spiritual journey in Quakerism more than 30 years ago and was very struck by the simplicity of the belief system in that tradition. The only tenet that is held to be central to the faith is the idea that every person has a sacred light or a sacred spark within. And as a consequence of that divinity inside, each person should be treated, must be treated, with justice and fairness and nonviolence and so on. These are very powerful concepts when they're taken seriously as Quakers take them. But we can think of this divine light within as having all of these properties of giving our lives meaning, of giving meaning to the people and the other life forms that we share the planet with, of moving us through the world, motivating us to manifest, create, to help, and to grow. Well, one way we can grow is in how we relate to reality, as discussed in the first talk of this series. Our dominant culture encourages us to come at reality with a relationship of separateness, looking at ourselves as isolated individuals who need to struggle against a competitive and difficult world. We have to fight other people, compete with them to get what is coming to us. And if we succeed, we end up on top. And if we fail, we end up on the bottom in a kind of miserable, barely survivable existence. You know, this is the world view that our culture has adopted at its core. Now that may be a somewhat harsh way of saying it, but it's not you know, terribly off the mark, I don't believe. Yet there is an alternative relationship that we can foster with reality and often do, and that's to feel connected, to feel that there's a supportive aspect. There's certainly support in our ecology, a whole world, uh, a biosphere that makes life possible, and there's support with all of the people who are kind-hearted and want to try to help. So there is plenty of evidence for connectedness in the world. But in this culture, we tend to de-emphasize that in favor of seeing all the strife and competition and the necessity to dominate, etc. Well, there's no reason we can't change that. And the fire within will help motivate and guide us in that growth so that we can de-emphasize our sense of separation and augment our sense of connectedness. Of course, to function in the world, we need to you know, recognize that we are, in some sense, individual organisms. But we don't need to continually operate from a place of isolation. We can relate to reality as a connected whole. 
relating to reality as a connected whole would have seemed quite natural, I believe, to our distant ancestors, such as those who painted these cave drawings some 30,000 years ago. Looking at these drawings, I'm struck by how the people are not portrayed as being separate from or dominant over the animals. If anything, the people are minor characters relative to the much larger animal figures, and they certainly aren't separate. They're completely interwoven. The idea of humanity being interwoven comes naturally to much more recent peoples as well. Anywhere on earth where people live in close communion with nature, they tend to have a feeling of connectedness with the natural environment, which after all is only what you'd expect of a people that depend upon nature for their sustenance, you know, in a very direct way rather than the indirect way that we do. So there's this saying from the Lakota Nation in North America, when one sits in the hoop of the people, one must be responsible because all creation is related and the herd of one is the herd of all. This is a very eloquent statement of connection in life and on earth. It's borne out by what we've looked at in the prior talks in this series. When we talked about the air element, we saw how it connects us in an intimate and shared atmosphere, how we breathe in oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide, and that the former is released by plants and the latter is used by plants, and that these molecules circulate around the globe in a very thin and vulnerable layer, and we all share it, and we all live together as a consequence, each of us taking what we need and releasing what others need. Or the water element, how we imbibe water in our liquid drinks and in our food, and then release it back to the environment, and in that way participate in the same cycle that evaporates water from the oceans and raises it up into clouds until it cools and falls again as rain in an ongoing cycle, and we are simply part of that. And as we contemplate these truths, we're doing so with a brain that itself is 75% water. And so water is everywhere in our lives and moving through the environment, and we are temporarily diverting it into our organisms and then releasing it back. Again, a sense of very profound relatedness to the earth. Or the earth element as found in our skeletons that remind us of our evolutionary history and our relatedness to other life on earth in a vast and beautiful family tree. Again, relationship. So we live in this relational cosmos and the science fully bears that out so that these more ancient people that didn't have the benefits that we do enjoy as civilized beings, as, as people who you know, are living in a modern technological society, they certainly didn't have our health care and so on, but they were pretty spot on when it came to understanding how life actually works on Earth and how interrelated it is. Another example of this interrelationship comes from those little molecular organ systems shared by every living cell on the planet. Again, there's just this incredible interrelatedness where we all are of one form of life, ultimately. So we can use all this biological information, as simple and basic as it may be, to build out a very profound sense of being connected with other beings and the earth at large. In your meditation times, you could spend a while contemplating what it's like to breathe in oxygen that was released from deep within the tissues of plants, what it's like to feel liquid in your body that came from the sky and will return to the ocean and will continue to cycle and has cycled through endless time on earth from one organism to the next, from one landscape to the next. Or the earth element, this powerful bony skeleton and the substantial muscles that move it and the connection between the bone and the mountains where there's calcium in the bone and calcium in the limestone deposits, etc or the shared 
heritage of this molecular generator, this organ system in every cell on earth. You can contemplate this connectedness and it can be quite soothing, bringing out this very healthful sense of connection. Well, that's one side of the story. You know, on the other hand, there's a lot in the modern world that doesn't look so supportive. There's degradation of the planet and of the atmosphere. There's war and all sorts of violence and injustice. You know, the list of difficult and painful realities that we face today is long. And so it's natural that at times we will feel fairly separated and at risk. So this quality of separation that our culture encourages anyway seems to find a certain amount of validation. The idea of separateness has you know, kind of been built into civilization from the beginning as people separated themselves into different classes and wealthy classes came to dominate the poorer classes. But it, it jumped forward in intensity quite a lot around the time of the Industrial uh, revolution and has continued to be amplified with the rise of neoliberal capitalism so that we ha now have a you know, wealthy class that feels almost no responsibility for people less uh, who, who have fewer resources. Long ago, the wealthy people at least felt some responsibility to the poor who, also, who after all lived in the same region and whom they saw every day. Now, there seems to be no sense at all among most of the wealthy classes that they should help out in any substantive way the people that don't uh, control the same sorts of resources. And this has been you know, an accelerating problem since uh, the beginning of the industrial era. The worldview behind it is pretty well summed up by this saying uh, from Jacques Monod, a Nobel Prize winning biologist of the 20th century. Man knows at last that he is alone in the universe's unfeeling immensity. His destiny is nowhere spelled out, nor is his duty. So this idea of an unfeeling, immense, vast, and ultimately meaningless cosmos in which none of us has any duty to anything other than our own you know, desire. Uh, you know, this is kind of the underlying worldview that seems to have crept into uh, our civilization. But it's clearly not inevitable that people will view the world that way because we have this alternative that sees life as being inherently much more supportive and connected than that. And this alternative is much more ancient and venerable than the relatively recent idea that people have no responsibility at all for one another or the cosmos. Generally, in the dominant view, these older perspectives that people are related to animals and have a loving uh, bond with them and share the world with them, that's looked at as a kind of crude and unscientific and you know, ultimately uh, naive way of looking at the world. And in our modern sensibility, we tend to think, well, no, we understand better now how the world actually works. We know about the importance of competition in the survival of the fittest and the battle for life, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's well documented that as the Native Americans watched the Europeans invade and degrade their territory, that they were dismayed by the crude and ignorant attitudes of these invaders, their lack of understanding of how nature works and what it requires. So it's by no means certain that our perspective is somehow or another more advanced or evolved. It's simply something that has served to advance technology and in particular to enrich the people who are in a position to benefit. But it doesn't serve all of us and it doesn't serve the planet. And so we have a choice. We can move in the direction in our own lives and you know, in our own speech to begin to emphasize the reality of connection in the world. 
a book that I think describes the tension between the modern technological worldview and these more ancient perspectives is this one, The Web of Meaning by Jeremy Lent. I happened upon it after I'd already prepared this talk, but it is a very good background reading uh, that uh, does a you know, very comprehensive job of explaining something that I've sketched out you know, in really coarse detail. There's a sense in which the emphasis on connection versus separation may relate to the relative strengths of the right versus the left hemisphere of the brain. So it's pretty well known, I believe, that the left hemisphere is verbal, it's oriented toward time sequences, and it's analytical. These qualities mean that it is very natural for the left hemisphere to see the world in a kind of dualistic, separated way. The right hemisphere, in contrast, is more musical and it's tuned to spatial arrangement and orientation and it's intuitive rather than analytical. And these qualities mean that the right hemisphere is much more capable of taking in and seeing as important qualities of connection. The book, My Stroke of Insight by neuroanatomist Jill Bolt Taylor gives a direct description of what it's like when the left hemisphere goes offline and we're reliant on only the right hemisphere for a time as she was. And the experience she had was one of vast interconnectedness and supportiveness, actually. So there may be a sense in which these two worldviews that I'm mapping can be also mapped onto these hemispheres of the brain. And when we bring in the fire element and the ability, in fact, the eagerness of life to grow, we can use the fire element to motivate and guide and help us as we de-emphasize our feelings of separateness and cultivate feelings of connection. So the fire element that motivates us to grow is something that we can connect with in a palpable way in our bodies by feeling into the interior, by remembering our vast dependence on all the different aspects of the lived ecosphere. And we can use the fire element to grow in the direction of strengthening what might be a right hemisphere preference for feelings of connection, supported, supportiveness, and wholeness. And I encourage you to make that a part of your daily meditation practice and even your daily life to look for those instances of connection and supportiveness, and perhaps read a little bit less out of your news feeds, which after all emphasize separation and strife and so on. And maybe together, all of us doing this bit by bit, gradually feeling more and more connected with our bodies, with one another, and with the ecosphere, maybe we can gradually turn the direction of our culture away from its more toxic aspects and toward its more positive virtues. Thank you for watching this episode and this series about entirety.